Before meeting Andy for the first time, I had previously formed a solid judgment on who I thought he was. From previous conversations on Facebook, a few photographs of the man himself, and the hundreds of art pieces I had seen, I was expecting to see a large man, over six feet and around 300 pounds. I expected him to be crazy, unable to have concise, coherent conversation, and to be honest, I was expecting a crude human being. However, when I arrived at Bowie Gallery in Kittery, Maine, to meet Andy at a music performance the week before his opening, I was surprised at the person I met. Yes, he was heavy set, but couldn't have been over 5'10". He wore a long, baggy black t-shirt draped over shin-length dicky shorts, black sneakers, and a black baseball cap. The crazy, incoherent, crude man? Quite the opposite. He was well-mannered, humble, slightly timid, and down-to-earth. I had no qualms talking with him as he filled me in on the performance taking place. We were watching an act from New York City titled Champagne Jerry. It was a rap troupe made up of two females and two males. Due to personal tastes, it was difficult to watch, but they certainly got the crowd going throughout the show. My biggest qualm was the distinct imbalance of the group taking themselves seriously as rappers and their ironic commentary on the world of underground hip-hop. However, it was the first of eight shows on their tour, so maybe they worked through this dichotomy as their set was refined. After the performance, I finally had some time to get to know Andy Heck Boyd. I was surprised at the rate we opened up to each other, being able to bond over mutual friends such as Jordan Rote, Derek Bowser, Gabby Sepita, and Nate Hitchcock. The conversation soon unfolded to an overview of Andy's past. Andy had always been interested in art. His father is a well-respected tattoo artist and has been operating a tattoo shop, Jim's Tattoos, in Seabrook, New Hampshire, since 1977. Andy told me he doesn't show his father any of his work because he doesn't understand why Andy makes scribble drawings when he also harbors a talent for realistic work. When Andy graduated from Exeter Area High School, in his mind there were two options. Either train as an apprentice to take over the tattoo shop or go to school to pursue a career in film. Andy chose the latter and enrolled in the New England Institute of Art in Brookline, Massachusetts to become the next Stanley Kubrick. From 2000 to 2001, he completed two semesters studying TV broadcasting and video production while being involved in the local film scene. He then transferred and spent a semester studying filmmaking at Rockport College in Maine. Andy's life took a turn darker as a dormant mental illness rose from the depths of his psyche. Accompanied by voices in his mind and a psychotic delusions, Andy was diagnosed with schizophrenia and moved home to battle his mental illness. Now, over 10 years later, Andy is still on disability and maintains his sanity through a balance of medication and an endless stream of cathartic artworks. This is one of the many facts that makes Andy's work so appealing. Of course, he is well studied and versed in the world of art, but his work is much more than just a reflection of this view. His work is pure, a subconscious commentary, a blatant stab to revive his childhood, a strive towards sanity by getting the images that flood his impressive mind on the paper, screen, or sculpture with little to zero filter. Bowie Gallery in Kittery, Maine, where Andy's work will be on display for the greater part of July, was opened six years ago. One of the main operators who has been there from the start is a man named Alex Mead. Alex is also the bartender at the restaurant that shares a space with the gallery, the Black Birch. Doing this, he is able to always keep the gallery open, as well as drive in some foot traffic. He is hardworking and efficient. He deserves a lot of credit for keeping the premier avant-garde art space of Maine and New Hampshire running smoothly. As Andy said in passing, this is pretty much the only gallery around not pushing paintings of lighthouses. Most of the acts and artists featured at Bowie Gallery are local friends of friends and spread through word of mouth. 
Alex cited one of the biggest difficulties he has is attracting foot traffic for artists he features from outside of the New England area. Upon viewing Andy's one-room apartment, I was slightly awestruck by the mounds of work Andy had created. What appeared to be a lifetime of artwork had been created in just the past three years. That's how long I've been painting, Andy says. I spent nearly an hour and a half furiously digging through these piles of work, trying to keep my legs from going numb as I crouched on his floor. Andy is planning on moving to Seattle with his brother soon. This struck me as a surprise, seeing as Andy is known to have overwhelming fits of anxiety at the thought of leaving the small seacoast area where he lives. He told me he was going to throw all his work away before he leaves. I urged him not to, and that he should at least put them in a plastic tub and bury them, if nothing else. He didn't seem totally against the idea. I asked Andy if he ever works on a piece for an extended period of time. I worked on one for two days. Andy has created over 1,000 pieces in the last six months. In preparation for this show, in which he tastefully narrowed it down to just 23 projected animations and 30 digital prints. The name of the show, Andy Heck Boyd, Digital Prints, stems from a sort of cross between Purple Rain and Richard Prince. Over 90% of the work was created on either an iPhone or iPad. However, this is loudly unapparent upon viewing them in person. The prints fit the prior description of Andy's work, yet the animations take a slightly different path. They were a mixture of short, fast ADHD mashup animations and long, drawn-out, tongue-in-cheek commentary humor. Andy claims there is a slight underhanded element of trying to figure out how long someone will keep paying attention to something after the punchline point has clearly been made. It's an idea he wishes to pursue further in the future works. My personal favorite is titled Pinoku, in which Andy painstakingly animated frame by frame pieces of raw meat and cold cuts over all the characters in the first six minutes of Pinocchio. The animation ends with a clip taken from Dinosaurs, the Terrible Lizards by Hua Ming Chang, in which a stop animation Tyrannosaurus Rex is devouring a carcass. It then flashes to a clip of Pinocchio lying dead in the water as the animation ends. I arrived at Bowie Gallery at 6.30 on Friday, August 8, 2014. The show had been in progress for half an hour so far. The room was empty except Andy, his friend Joe, Alex, and what appeared to be a few of Alex's acquaintances. Within 10 minutes, the gallery had been filled with another 20 patrons who seemed to appreciate the art and greatly appreciate the free refreshments. What came as a surprise is the average age of attendees seemed to be around 45, which is great for selling art. I expected a younger crowd, given Andy's popularity on the web and the general nature of his works. There was commonplace, light-hearted conversation, with most attention being paid to the prints. Full attention was only paid by few to the animations. As the sun was starting to set, there was talks amongst the crowd of cooking fresh lobster at home, and soon the audience was trickling out of the gallery doors. It was dark out now. A second wave of around 30 people had filled the confines of buoy. This wave of patrons was younger and fit the age range I had been expecting. The room is dead quiet as everyone is standing in a large circle watching the projections. Small chuckles and awkward laughter fill the stale air. Not completely genuine, but the animations are starting to draw the crowd in. Slowly the laughter becomes natural as Andy's hand-drawn, irreverent punchlines dance along. I see Alex is now selling a few more of Andy's prints. Any worries that Andy or myself may have had of the show not being perceived were shot down. The childish ring of the audio from the animations, the click of a typewriter in the distance, and bursts of laughter coupled with high-spirited conversations make for a complete environment. The projected animation shone brightly on the 16 by 9 foot screen provided a wonderful platform for Andy's schizophrenic childhood chasing fables. And the show's over, but there are still people standing around. About an hour ago, Andy shook my hand and abruptly walked out the door. He warned me he may get too anxious and have to leave. 
Yet there the people stood, shining with laughter and stealing glances at the looping animation. The dream of Andy's works being illuminated by such a healthy social aura is a mission accomplished. As Andy is such a quiet recluse, this is the dream his paintings so silently shout. Be it on the walls of Bowie Gallery, stacked upon stacks in the purview of Andy's small one-room apartment, or zipping across the threads of cyberspace. <laughs>